be balancing, the customers are still complaining. Complaining that the trains don't run on time, and that even when they do, too often they can't get a seat. It was in 1983 that the government set out to get British Rail off the taxpayers' backs and to slash the £930 million it was costing them each year. The industry was split into self-governing businesses. Ministers set business-like objectives and ordered British Rail to get on and cut its costs. The results are there for all to see. Uh, they have 69 million more passengers a year. Uh, their finances are in better order. Uh, their productivity has improved. Uh, there have been very big investment programs, hundreds of new wagons, hundreds of new trains introduced into the system, dozens of stations modernised. The group's surplus has climbed from under £8 million to well over £300 million. Productivity has risen consistently as the workforce has fallen by nearly 45,500. And those subsidies from the taxpayer have more than halved in real terms in seven years. Ministers rejoiced. The passengers didn't. The newly commercial state monopoly could charge what its market would bear, and it did. With no competition, it also, it seemed, offered a service its customers had to tolerate. The average commuter or average traveller, of course, is more concerned with the balance of probability of whether he or she will arrive on time or whether they'll get a seat uh, than with the state of the balance sheet. So we have a railway system that financially appears to be doing very well, but I'm afraid the customers and certainly the staff are not very happy uh, with things as they are today, certainly in respect to the quality of the service being provided. Fares in most of the past six years have on average risen more than the rate of inflation. Last year, intercity long distance commuters suffered a 21% rise. This year, there's another 15% on top of that. There is a deliberate view, uh, I think held by some people in government and probably some in BR, that you should actually force fares up to near to the limit that people will pay. And if trains are very crowded, rather than provide extra trains, it is actually um, financially a better bet to push the fares up further until such time as you balance the number of people who are willing to pay with the number of seats which you've got to sell. The Secretary of State for Transport doesn't disagree. Rail travel has become a seller's market and Cecil Parkinson sees the market working. We don't think there have been any excessive increases for passengers. In fact, if you look in real terms uh, at fare increases over the last five years, they've been quite low indeed. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that uh, the number of passengers, for instance, on Network South East has increased by 25% as the subsidy has gone down. So it doesn't seem to have been deterring people from using the system. Outside Westminster, things look different. Industrial areas rebuilding their economies see the rail network as a vital asset. Poor communications, they believe, threaten economic survival. 17 at 38, from Plymouth. This commuter belt around Leeds is typical. The number of commuter journeys here has doubled in five years to 14 million a year. It's part of a national railway boom which has caught the railway planners on the hop. Their fleets of diesel trains were worn out. They rushed in replacements, but they developed major mechanical faults and deliveries were months late. The result, overcrowding and cancelled trains. I feel very annoyed because I've been commuting for just over a year now and it's always been the same and I'm amazed that British Rail haven't actually put any extra carriages onto this particular train. I'm sure this is because of the financial constraints under which uh, they operate. A reduction in the amount of money available for the day-to-day -day running of the industry, that's a reduction in real terms. And when it comes to investment, I think, frankly, tending to look for the cheapest possible buy they can find, and also, certainly in relation to rolling stock, to order the minimum amount they think will meet the demand. And, of course, with the rise in demand that has been for railway travel over the last six years in particular, uh, that's the consequence, is the overcrowding, is rolling stock being run far more intensively than it's capable of doing so. So we see the delays, we see the problems, we see the complaints. 
It isn't cash constraints. It may be the fact that British Rail has been forced to buy British and that British manufacturers haven't delivered uh, rolling stock that is of the right standard, the right quality, that isn't reliable. Now, uh, as a government, we're prepared to accept the blame for a lot of things, but I don't think you can ask, ask us to accept the blame for the fact that the manufacturers of railway engines don't meet the specifications of their customers and deliver late. But critics insist that it's long before delivery, it's at the planning stage, that the government is stifling new investment in the railways. This is the high-speed main line from London, which serves the East Midlands. The councils along the route want the line to be electrified, but British Rail says no, because the return it would get on the investment it would need just wouldn't meet the strict financial criteria laid down by the government. The councils argue that those criteria are too narrow and that the government should take into account the economic benefits to the area that an electrified railway will bring, not least of all getting some of the traffic off of the roads back onto the railways. But the government won't. Ministers have control over major investment in new projects. They insist that such spending should yield an 8% return. And in working out the sums, they refuse to take into account the wider social benefits that better rail services might bring to a region. We're not allowed to take uh, external factors into consideration in trying to put forward or justify any investment scheme. And we are a business operating within our own business criteria, and that must be the justification for investing for the future. It's a policy which is now questioned by the former top civil servant who administered it until five years ago. If you take a very narrow financial view of whether you shall provide an additional railway track, it may be very difficult to guarantee that that in itself will make a profit. But you need to take account of what the consequences are for the industries who will send their freight by rail if you do not provide that track. It may mean that they don't get a guaranteed service, but a much slower service. That ought to be taken into account before you take your decision on the railway, and the only way of doing that is not by a straight financial analysis, but by an economic cost-benefit analysis. We don't see that that's any reason for subsidising a service that can be commercial, like uh, intercity, like freight, like parcels, like, I believe, Network South East can be, uh, with the new rolling stock, the new investment, and the additional passengers that it's been attracting. So, yes, we're not anti-subsidy, we're just anti-unnecessary subsidy. The Channel Tunnel, which will deliver passengers to a new terminal here at Waterloo in London, gives British Rail its biggest opportunity this century. But there are high-level doubts whether it can seize that opportunity under the government's restrictions. Sir Robert Reid, the outgoing chairman of British Rail, the man who masterminded its commercial turnaround, warned last month that Britain could miss the new railway age. This is what alarms him, a fast-spreading European network of high-speed rail systems. The French and Belgians, he said, were creating new European transport hubs with fast rail services radiating from major airports. Without similar enterprise, Britain's railways and roads could be strangled out of the market. We're not just sitting back and hoping. A great deal's happening here. But what I sometimes think is that we give the credit to the French for having done something that they say they're thinking about, and we ignore the things that are actually happening here. A new rail infrastructure like Sir Robert wants would cost billions more. His supporters say the only source for that sort of money is from where the French, the Germans and other Europeans have provided it, from the coffers of the government. It's been a test of virility for governments for years to keep down the um, level of public expenditure. I think that transport, in transport, this leads to a ridiculous situation in which most transport is paid for by the private sector, but there are certain things, and railways are one, which can only be paid for initially by the state. And the government ration this like everything else. 
In Europe, our competitors are confident that the 1990s will be a new age of the train. The French, the Germans, the Belgians and the Dutch are investing billions in it already. It could prove economically disastrous if Britain, once again, goes down the wrong track.